Hello, ladies and gents. I got nine questions here, innocently asked questions about being a friend with borderline personality disorder. These questions come uh, from a girl in her 20s who was friends with another girl in her 20s with BPD. So I want to say some things off the bat before we get into these nine questions. I am not sure that borderline personality disorder as we have it today is a completely valid diagnosis. Yes, I'm just some guy on YouTube, but I'm not alone in this. There are actual clinicians, there are people with master's degrees and PhDs and therapists who agree with my position. We, have this, we share the same position that if you look at this as a personality disorder, it doesn't really seem to have the structural integrity that a personality disorder would need in order to be a distinct clinical entity. I also think it's highly likely that this is a personality disorder that is massively overdiagnosed, particularly in women, particularly in women under the age of 30, when those women are simply traumatized. They have PTSD and or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And because that isn't being recognized or looked for enough by clinicians, they're saying that they have borderline personality disorder when they don't. Borderline personality disorder is known to go into spontaneous remission in the late 30s when people become more emotionally regulated and particularly in women, perhaps there are even hormonal changes that affect that. That therefore would mean this is not a personality disorder as such. I'm not saying it's not significant. I'm not saying if you've been diagnosed with it that it's wrong. I'm not saying that if you've been diagnosed with BPD, BPD doesn't matter or that if you suffer, your pain isn't real. If you have CPTSD or if you have PTSD and you're traumatized, your suffering is very, very real. And life with PTSD is extremely tough. It's so tough that it doesn't matter your gender, your ethnicity, your age or your background, it frequently induces at least passive suicidal ideation. It's enormously tough to live with trauma. That all being said, let's get into the nine questions about BPD. Is it true that life with BPD is like very hard? Yes. That it's almost impossible to be happy? Yes. Not happy time to time, but like to be a positive person? Yes, it's very, very hard if you live with somebody who has borderline personality disorder or they have that diagnosis. That means at least they're extremely emotionally dysregulated. They have an extremely labile sense of self. They're probably experiencing inner critic superego attacks all the time. They're probably going to have massive issues around intimacy and an extremely anxious, extremely insecure attachment style. So they'll be very prone to jealousy. They'll be very up and down. They'll be very easily provoked in their emotions into negative emotional states sometimes not even by anything you've done or said, but by something that their own mind has come up with or the way that their emotionally dysregulated brain has interpreted a completely innocent interaction. When that goes on across time over months and years, the person sadly, tragically becomes conditioned into a habitual pattern of blowing up over nothing and I would claim they can even become addicted to the uh, rage that borderline personality disorder is um, marked by. It's one of the traits, it's one of the nine traits by which um, borderline personality disorder is diagnosed clinically. So that extreme emotional dysregulation makes life very, very tough. If you have lived with somebody with borderline personality disorder or somebody who has PTSD, this is clinically true. There's research that indicates that this is true. What I'm about to say for both, whether it was clinically diagnosed BPD or PTSD, it is highly likely that you will end up with secondhand trauma as well. You will become traumatized by that experience because as you live with the person, you go into rapport with the person, you're entrained and conditioned into your life with that person. As their emotions go up and down, as their adrenaline spikes and drops, yours will too. Yes, it's very, very tough to be a happy, positive person if you are in love with and living with somebody who either has PTSD, CPTSD, or has borderline personality disorder. I also read that people who have BPD that they usually choose to not be in this existence anymore before the age of 27. Is that true? No, it's one of the myths of borderline personality disorder. 
it is not statistically true that most people diagnosed with BPD choose to not live on this plane of reality anymore before the age of 27. But I have heard that said and read it uh, multiple times in YouTube comments, on Reddit forums and in other places. Um, there is no statistics that indicate that that, uh, that is the case. There are no statistics that indicate that that is the case. I do speak English. How is it with people with BPD and their favorite person? I read that when they have a favorite person, they don't need anyone else in life and they get very attached to them. Yes, this is probably going to be more true for younger people who would qualify for the BPB, BPD diagnosis. It would be more true for them that they will fixate on one person. But there are other mental health issues that can contribute to this. The anxious and insecure attachment style might induce a tendency in somebody to put all of their eggs in one basket. If somebody is very introverted or has a lot of social anxiety disorder that makes them isolate from people, they become very, very lonely, then when they can have one person who's passed their tests, because people with BPD will frequently test their friends and partners, another aspect of a relationship with BPD that is quite exhausting. If you've passed those tests, then you're the one person they can trust and you will feel an enormous weight of responsibility on you because you are then the one human being that they have intimate contact with and they really don't have intimate contact with anybody else. So if you become their favorite person, it's, um, it's an awful lot of responsibility. It's really not fair to put that much responsibility on one person, but it does happen. I would avoid if you suspect that the person has BPD or even ADHD. ADHD people can be known to do this as well. Uh, to fixate on one human being and make them center of the world, you really must discourage these kinds of relationships. Be strong, be boundaried. Don't let yourself slide into these kinds of relationships. Even if it seems cute or it seems romantic or whatever it is you're experiencing when you're there, you don't want to be the one person at the center of somebody's universe. Believe me, I have lived this now twice and it is extremely painful, extremely difficult, and will just make you feel a tremendous amount of guilt and responsibility. You then have to live for yourself as an adult human being, which is very hard, and for the other person as well. It's no good, no bueno. Is it good to be friends with someone who has BPD or is it better not to? It is generally speaking not desirable to be friends with people who have strong mental health issues like this. No, it's not, it's not great. Um, if somebody has PTSD, if they have CPTSD, if they're highly emotionally dysregulated, they really need therapy. They need strong therapeutic intervention. And hey, the prognosis is good, um, which is another reason why it's probably not truly a personality disorder. So there are modalities that have been proven multiple times under clinical conditions to really help with borderline personality disorder. Brackets, it's probably CPTSD. And this is a dialectical behavioral therapy developed by a BPD sufferer called Marsha Linehan. DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Enormously successful, probably one of the most uh, successful therapeutic modalities that psychotherapy has ever seen across contexts, across cultures, and across time. And um, it can be shown, it's been shown to really, really help people who've got the BPD diagnosis for people who are struggling with CPTSD, DBT will massively help. But no, it's not good, it's not preferable to have uh, friendships with people who have strong uh, mental health issues. I'm not saying you should shun them or isolate them, they should be treated with compassion, they should be treated with empathy, but it's not good, let's say it's not good to be the girlfriend of a guy who really doesn't need a girlfriend, he really needs a therapist. It's not good to be the best friend of a girl who really doesn't need a best friend. She really needs a therapist. And if being the girlfriend or boyfriend of somebody who should be in therapy keeps them from going to therapy or makes them believe that they don't need it, that's, that's not ideal. These are serious issues. PTSD is not taken seriously enough. That's why I think people cling to sometimes 
They can cling to the BPD diagnosis and say, no, no, I definitely have borderline personality disorder. It's not enough to say that I'm just traumatized. Whereas I would be in a position of advocating to say, no, PTSD and CPTSD are horrendous conditions. They're so ubiquitous throughout the personality. They affect your hormones. They affect your brain, literally changing the shape of your brain. They, they affect your perceptions. So fundamentally, we should be taking these things more seriously. And I think the borderline personality disorder needs further analysis. We should probably shelve it for a, for a little while um, because nobody really knows what it is. And if you want to get into it, we can get into it on another video there's a really good chance that borderline personality disorder, based on its history and its cultural context, where it came from, let me phrase this carefully, cannot be successfully divided from a kind of fundamental sexism. There's this is me saying this. There's pretty strong evidence to indicate that borderline personality disorder, historically, up until today, as a diagnostic criteria, is marred by the subjective sexism of the clinicians who, who dish it out. We'll talk about that in another video. If you want that video, just put it in the comments and we'll, we'll do it there because that's a, whole can of, <laughs> that's a whole can of worms. When someone has BPD, are they automatically a bad person? We don't use these terms in psychology. You're not a bad person. It's a uh, psychology and psychotherapy. Uh, one of its strengths is one of its greatest weaknesses is it's amoral. It doesn't get into morality. And I think in the therapeutic context, specifically, the sacred relationship between the therapist and the client, it shouldn't really be a morally judgmental endeavor because it doesn't help. It doesn't help for me as a, as a therapist, oh, you're a bad person. Uh, we really need together to explore what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and can we untangle this cluster of feelings and behaviors and patterns of, of, of perception and response in such a way that makes it easier for you to live and easier for you to have intimate relationships. So a bad person, no, we don't, uh, in psychology, you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't say that. Are they automatically a bad person? Or they can be nice people and only have problems inside of them. So in the online BPD communities, people have tried to pass BPD into like quiet borderline or like nice borderline or non-abusive borderlines. Look, I'll, I'll give you my dogma. So I follow the American Psychiatric Association definitions. They are far from perfect. I use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual to offer my analyses of these personality disorders. These personality disorders don't exist in a, you know, like philosophical, ontological sense. They are social constructs that help clinicians decide the best course of action for therapeutic intervention for clients. They're not real. There's no blood test for BPD. There's no blood test for uh, histrionic personality disorder. These are models, and I think that this particular model, I think I've made it clear in this video, is out of date. So I would say no, there's, we can't pass this. In the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Volume 5, this is in the cluster B spectrum of personality disorders. If the person is not highly abusive, it's not useful to say it's borderline personality disorder. Because if they're not highly abusive, how are they in the cluster B? How are they next door to psychopathy. And let me also add, the way that certain elements of psychology are moving now, there's a chance that borderline personality disorder and narcissism may be reclassified as subtypes of psychopathy. So no, there's no way, I, I'm not interested in an endeavor to rescue BPD from um, notions of like uh, negative moral uh, pers uh, pers negative moral action, negative moral perspectives at all. I think it should be, I think it should be allowed to float away as it is. It's not a great uh, diagnostic criteria. If the person is not abusive and they are fundamentally a nice person, but very confused and they have all nine traits of the diagnostic criteria of BPD, you know, they have very labile sense of self, they can, um, they're extremely emotionally dysregulated, they can fly into a rage, their perceptions are just like corrupted completely by the emotional dysregulation that's going on in their body and so on and so forth. That's all accounted for 
by PTSD. That's all amply accounted for and more. It's better described and better explained by complex PTSD. We don't need uh, BPD and it's not, in my humble opinion, a useful diagnosis. So can they be nice people and only have problems on the inside? Uh, that would be CPTSD. I don't know how to explain this question better. Don't worry, you're right there with some of the best clinicians in the world who are struggling and sometimes arguing over this one particular issue. And this argument has been going on for decades now. I don't know how, how to explain this question, but like, is it for a person bad to have someone with BPD in their life? Or is BPD bad for the person who has it and it doesn't affect friendships, etc.? Now you're asking good psychological questions because in order for it to be, this, this question is the question that clinicians are asking right now because uh, they're, they're also having this argument about narcissism. In order for it to be a personality disorder, it should be permanent, pervasive, and personal. It should be rigid. It should be consistent across time, across contexts, across cultures. It should be in the person, and it should be throughout the person. It's not just in one context. It's not just one part of them, and it's not a, uh, it's not a culture or context-based. So if you're a narcissist, you're a narcissist when you sleep. You're a narcissist when you do your accounts. You're a narcissist when you uh, buy fruit at the shops all the time and it's right the way through you it's not one part of your personality is narcissistic but another part of your personality is benign no that wouldn't qualify you for mpd we would just say that person has high narcissistic traits this is the this is the sibling of borderline personality disorder these things sit together in the cluster b so for borderline personality disorder they're going to say is this permanent pervasive and personal and they're also going to ask is it maladaptive does it hurt the person Yes. Does it hurt the people in the environment around them? Yes. If it's yes and yes, then it qualifies as a personality disorder. If it's only hurting the person, but doesn't hurt the environment around them, that might not be a personality disorder. If it only hurts the environment around them, but doesn't hurt the person, that might not be a personality disorder. And on that basis, some people are challenging BPD and MPD as, as personality disorders because the argument is if it hurts the environment, but not the person, then it's not a personality disorder. And you might say, this all sounds a bit YouTuberish and esoteric, but wait a minute. The guy who headed up the 23 person committee to define narcissistic personality disorder for the DSM-5. He's the authority for MPD. He came out publicly and said in 2016 that Donald Trump could not have narcissistic personality disorder because none of his behaviors hurt him. They only benefited him. So this is not YouTube uh, nonsense gossip we're talking right now. This is, the, this is the highest echelons of the American Psychiatric Association. This isn't a guy who sat on the committee for MPD. This is the guy who headed the committee for MPD, said, look, if it only hurts the environment and not the person, that's not a personality disorder. So what would the, it would almost be like the inverse for BPD. Some people are saying, well, be, this, this client I have, I say they're BPD, but they do nothing to hurt other people, nothing. They have no impact on the environment. It's all internal pain. They suffer and they do nothing to anybody else, if that is true, in my humble opinion. And in the opinion of, most of my opinions are actually quite mainstream. I think it's because I swear a little bit. I can sound like I'm like radical or, or, or on some fringe. I'm really not. Most of my opinions on psychology are actually extremely mainstream. I agree with them. I would say, no, that's, that's not a personality disorder. That can't be a personality disorder. That is, as I said, PTSD, CPTSD, and treatable as such. Next question. Sixth question. Is it possible for somebody to have BPD symptoms only when they are in a relationship, like in love with somebody? That would be um, a traumatized person with um, either an avoidant uh, or an anxious or an insecure attachment style. Um, so only in intimacy are they provoked. Again, that's not a personality disorder. And that probably would be resolvable within three to six months of therapy. And especially if uh, the partner went to therapy with them and, you know, the three adults were in the room and they're like having conversations about things that have triggered this uh, response and we're all working on it together, three to six months, that would be resolved. 
That's not a personality disorder. Personality disorders are rigid and they're extremely difficult to treat because they have structural integrity. They have a robustness to them. Even though they're maladaptive and they hurt the person, they're still quite uh, robust, which makes them stubborn. They're highly resistant to change. They're not uh, open, they're not flexible. That would mean if, if something was flexible and easy to treat, you wouldn't call that a personality disorder. It wouldn't meaningfully be a personality disorder. So I know what you're talking about. You're talking about a person who can seem to exhibit all the behaviors of BPD. They suddenly, they get into a relationship and they're living their life and talking like the lyrics of a Linkin Park or Nine Inch Nails song. Everything is highly dramatic, highly emotionally dysregulated, full of self-loathing and self-pity and drama. That's, it's not a personality disorder. That's the person getting triggered by intimacy. Three to six months of therapy. I'm very hopeful that that person would be, like if the therapist is good, that issue would be resolved for life. As they age and mature also, and the hormones start to balance, your hormones aren't spiking as much, a lot of that stuff just disappears spontaneously anyway. But with three to six months of therapy, the outlook's good. Seventh question, is it curable? Well, it seems to be, again, which means it ain't a personality disorder, it's treatable. We don't, it's be unusual to say curable. They would say like, uh, you know, it's treatable with, you know, I don't even know what the success rate is for DBT, but I know that it's high. I know that dialectical behavioral therapy is, has got a high success rate. I don't know what the latest statistics are for it, um, but we would say, yeah, it's, it's treatable. It's the most treatable personality disorder by far. Probably flogging a dead horse here, that means, you guessed it, folks, probably isn't a personality disorder. Probably is horrible, probably is vicious, probably is extremely unpleasant to experience, but we're probably talking about trauma. And when people do dialectical behavioral therapy, if you look at it from the point of view of PTSD and CPTSD, and you see what Marsha Linehan has laid out for people to go through in order to recover from BPD, you'll be like, of course that works for somebody who's highly traumatized. Of course that would work for somebody with PTSD. When you are dating someone, what are some hints that they may have BPD? The kinds of things that you'd be looking out for that would get somebody uh, ringing the clinical bells for borderline personality disorder would be um, extremely emotionally intense. Uh, they would be very jealous. They would probably tell you things like, you're the only person who understands me. You're the most important person in my life. You would start to get the sense that they can't live without you. You would start to get the sense that if you terminated the relationship, they may hurt themselves, sometimes very seriously. You would become emotionally dysregulated where you're normally not. Uh, one of my experiences, and I'm ashamed to say it's not that long ago, was I became, uh, I developed an anxious attachment style. And that ain't, that's just not, it's, I have issues for sure, but that isn't one of them. And I noticed I was becoming extremely anxious uh, and started to develop uh, a fear of abandonment. And I'd always read it in the literature as, um, as uh, BPD, they have a, you know, at the core of BPD is this fear of abandonment. And I developed this, I acquired it through a kind of rapport or entrainment or contagion. And this was not fear of abandonment or abandonment anxiety, I was terrified. I experienced terror. I'm happy to report that I only had the most visceral experiences of that. I was living in Portugal at the time, it was 2017, maybe three times. And maybe it went on for like two hours at a time. But these were such horrendously strong experiences that for those moments, I had total empathy for all of the abusiveness and the lying and the clinging that I was experiencing inside of that relationship. I was like, oh my God, if this girl's walking around feeling this, it literally felt like I was gonna, I was gonna die. And I was like, oh, this is the world you live in. We went to therapy, ultimately the relationship terminated. It had to, I, I couldn't hold it up. Um, but I got to experience what real abandonment, terror, terror, terror feels like uh, I never would want to I wouldn't I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy and I wouldn't want to feel that again so people will hear me online being quite dismissive about borderline personality disorder I'm not dismissive of the humans I'm dismissive of the brand of the name of the label and I'm dismissive of people who cling to the label as a kind of a flex 
as a kind of a way of giving themselves importance. Like, well, I have BPD, so therefore you should listen to me, or therefore I have the right to say this horrible thing to you, or that horrible thing to you, or therefore I have, I'm entitled to this, that, and the other. I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this, that's not how this reality works. We're all adults here. We all have to suffer this hideous world. So I would say that like, as far as that goes, that goes for me into the, back into the slot of this is complex post-traumatic stress. And I have enormous empathy for people who suffer from PTSD and CPTSD because I do, and I know it makes daily life, normal daily life, torture. And if you don't have it and you've not experienced it, there's just, with, with the best will in the world, you're really never going to know what it's like. You can be kind, you can be empathic, I'm not taking that away from anybody, but unless you've lived with this stuff, you, you don't know what it's like. It's very, 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 very hard. The only experience I can relate it to is uh, when I was a kid and I took acid a few times and I had a few bad trips. It's the kind of ongoing bad trip. You feel terrified, your perceptions are rotten. Everything is threatening and frightening and weird and twisted and painful. It's really a hellscape for people who are heavily traumatized, very emotionally dysregulated. And uh, again, I just want to say like they, they really need, they need empathy, but they need therapy. They must go to therapy. They need therapeutic intervention. And good news, the therapeutic intervention is there and it works. So let's go, what are we waiting for? Is it good or bad to date someone with BPD? I, I, would, uh, I would rather you did not, even if they don't really have BPD, but they got the diagnosis because they're heavily emotionally dysregulated. Life is short, it's short and it's difficult anyway. Um, people with mental health issues, people like me, I wouldn't like myself. I think if I was gonna get any personality disorder diagnosis, it would have been in my, my late twenties and it would have been BPD. And I don't demand, I'm not like, I deserve a girlfriend when I was when I was sick. Well, I don't deserve a girlfriend at any point in my life. Nobody really deserves anything in my opinion. I wouldn't have said, no, I, I, I demand that you look after me when I'm mentally ill. No, no, I don't. You should stay away from me because I'm mentally ill. And my mental illness specifically is triggered by intimacy. And my mental illness is specifically around love and connection and safety. I would be a nightmare for you to be with. No, you shouldn't be with me. So I don't say from some aloof position, oh, abandon them, abandon these, uh, you know, these, uh, the, these uh, stinky peasants. No, they need help. They need help. They're not qualified for a relationship and not all human beings are. It takes resilience, it takes strength, it takes balance, it takes a willingness and a capacity to sacrifice to be in a, a loving relationship. People with CPTSD, people with PTSD, people who would have been diagnosed with BPD and all of the stuff that goes with it, we are not capable, we're not ready. Once the therapy is done, and if, you, you know, if, if you're committed to it, I would argue that people who've gone through CPTSD, who've gone through uh, BPD, probably theoretically could make better partners because they've done therapy, they've done, they know where their blind spots are. If they haven't fully integrated the shadow, they've at least explored their shadow and they know the value of vulnerable, intimate communication inside of a safe space, which is what therapy is. They're willing to have uncomfortable conversations. People who've not gone through it and you're like, okay, we need to sit down and have an uncomfortable conversation about something you said to me yesterday. They'll be like, oh God. And their instant response might be to start lying or protecting their ego or trying to, you know, deflect or put it back on you. If you've been through years of therapy, you just go, yeah, okay, let's have an uncomfortable conversation. I mean, I'm a black belt. I've been doing this for years. I've had, like most of my life, uncomfortable conversations about terrible things that happened. What has happened between me and you is nothing compared to some of the stuff that I've, had go, that I've gone through earlier in life. Let's talk about it. I don't mind at all. So hopefully once the people have been through therapy, yeah, they're in a much, much better position to create. I don't want to create like false expectations. They may even be in a position to be better partners than people who haven't gone through this. I'm very hopeful uh, for this diagnosis because I don't really believe in it in a dogmatic way. I heard from a lot of guys that they had goals with BPD and that they would never do it again. But why? What's so wrong about a relationship with them? It's, it's awful. I mean, speak to girls who've been in relationships with BPD men. I had, I've had BPD male clients. They're a nightmare. And uh, to be honest with you, they're the only clients I've ever had 
who really frightened me. I've had narcissistic clients, I've had psychopathic clients diagnosed. Um, I've had BPD women as clients, and they're exhausting, they're, they're a nuisance, and, and it made me sick in the end. I, I, stopped, I stopped coaching because I, I dealt with too many people who were too emotionally dysregulated, and it just burnt me out. Uh, but male, like you mentioned female BPD, male BPD, it's no joke, man. It's, it's really tough looking into the eyes of somebody who potentially could physically kill you. Like for, for, as a man, when I'm dealing with women and they're like that, I'm like, okay, I can see that you are very, very mentally sick, but there's really nothing. Like if you want to wrestle with me, I'm probably going to win. But you're sat across the table from a guy who's going into an emotional flashback and he has borderline personality disorder. It's frightening. It's frightening. It's like, I might not be able to stop this guy if he goes for me right now before he does damage to me that I'll never recover from. So it's not a question of saying, oh, like, well, women with BPD are so bad. Or, no, like men with BPD are a nightmare as well. BPD, so in order to get the BPD diagnosis, so let me just finish with being really clear with what I'm saying. It's serious. It's, it's real, but it's not, I just don't think we should be calling it BPD. I think we should be referring to it as complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Again, I'm not just some weirdo on the internet saying this. Many people agree with me. Judith Herman, the woman who came up with the concept of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, who's a professor of psychology at Harvard, she's um, pushing for BPD to be called emotional dysregulation uh, disorder or emotional dysregulation response. I can't remember. So I'm not alone in this. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely bad, you know, to be with somebody who's high, who's so emotionally dysregulated. Like if I say emotionally dysregulated or traumatized, you might think that's soft. You might be like, well, so what, like PTSD? That's for soldiers who were in Vietnam movies in the 80s, about the 60s. No, no. PTSD and trauma is very, very, very serious. CPTSD goes hand in hand with PTSD 99% of the time. It's brutal. These are brutal problems for a human being to have. You're then sat next to a person who their internal world is chaos. It's a hellscape. They are living in hell and you will live with them because they don't have the tools to help themselves. They need therapy. They need a therapeutic intervention. The therapy is there. It's well established and it works. Don't delay. Go, go get it. And, Leave like boyfriends, girlfriends, romance, ta, 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 ta. get therapy first. Get your therapy and, and do what you can to live a normal life. I don't want to end on a down note, but I do want to say this. We know that many people who get the BPD and CPTSD, when, when the clinician can diagnose CPTSD, which they often can't, but when they get the BPD diagnosis, it's massively associated with adverse childhood environments, childhood trauma. Childhood trauma, ACE, it's called, if you look up ACE, Adverse Childhood Environments, and mortality, people with ACE, people who are raised in adverse childhood environments, die younger. It's, a, it's not, oh, it's trauma, it's PTSD. I don't want that. I want to say I have a personality disorder. No. When you have trauma, when you have PTSD and you live with it, PTSD alone uh, changes the shape of your brain. Which part of the brain? It's the uh, hippocampus. It's the part of your brain that looks like a seahorse. It shrinks the volume of, the, of this part of the brain that they think, they don't know for sure, but they think it's, it's your ability to assign emotion to memory. So you have a diminished access, therefore, to access memories and to know how to associate an appropriate emotion and, an, and uh, appropriate and commensurate, like the, the correct size, and strength of the emotion to a memory. That's physical, it's observable. That's just one of the brain changes, observable physical brain changes that PTSD alone can cause. Imagine being a person who part of their brain that associates emotion with memory, which is pretty important, because if I withdraw your ability to associate all emotion with all your memory, you would probably experience almost 90% memory loss because you need to feel to remember. These people are living in a very, very confused state. Here's another thing, the dysregulation of the HPA axis. It's the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal gland when they talk to each other. Let's say, broadly speaking, painting in broad brush strokes, it's not a neurobiology lecture. Let's say that this is your threat assessment system, broadly speaking. 
so your HPA access becomes dysregulated in an observable way, your capacity to register threat is now damaged. It's now dysregulated. Somebody offers you a cup of tea and you might respond that like a panther just jumped out at you in the jungle. It's no joke. And it causes people to die younger. They are poorer. They have more illnesses. This is the ACE uh, standards, which is highly associated with BPD and CPTSD. They're poorer. They have a lower quality of life. They have worse nutrition. They develop, they're more likely to develop alcoholism. They're more likely to develop drug addiction. They're more likely to develop dependency uh, on, on food and substances and to engage in highly dangerous, uh, sexually promiscuous, unprotected behavior across time. All of this, it leads to terrible outcomes and it's literally a question of life and death. I don't say this to frighten you or to, or to bum you out. Like it's a YouTube video. I hate leaving people on a down note, but I really wish people would take trauma, childhood trauma, CPTSD, PTSD more seriously and kind of let go of the BPD diagnosis. Like we really don't know whether that's a distinct clinical entity or not. And for all the reasons I just gave you, it probably doesn't really qualify as a personality disorder. Everything I've said here, I've said with the intention of empathy and love. If people need help. They should get help. They should not be shunned. They should not be isolated. They should be offered help. But therapeutic intervention with a qualified clinician is always going to be superior to an online course, to a YouTube video, or a relationship. You can't patch mental health issues with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It won't work. It will exacerbate the symptoms over time. If you need help, or you know somebody who needs help, please find a qualified mental health professional. As I've said, dialectical behavioral therapy has been proven time and again across cultures across contexts to be highly effective for people who've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder who probably are struggling with the symptoms of CPTSD. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Cheers.